You can listen to the Backward Compatible Podcast anytime, anywhere, in any way you like. Subscribe and listen to us on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Then, join the discussion. Oh man, I have taken some sick pleasure in knocking people off of high places. This week on Backward Compatible, Richard returns from a weekend of research to share stories from the recently released Arc Age. This leads into an all-around discussion on the design and implementation of modern MMORPGs. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. All right, hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and this is number 10, the big one zero. We're in the double digits. Yay. Oh, man, double digits. We've grown up. Big old double Ds. <laughs> yeah, God so, damn it, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> and you might have noticed you heard the uh, the voice of Richard. It's been uh, two weeks now. But I'm alive. I'm here. R- Richard is alive. He's been... Um, Playing Arc Age, the MMO for uh, research project is now. Big before thesis. you guys start hurling insults at me, it's it's for my master's it's, thesis. It's for his master's so thesis. Back the fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but uh, yeah, yeah. So actually, that, that uh, sorry, go ahead, Jim. I was gonna say is it is it is Arc Age. It's not Arch Age. Yeah, it's Arc Age. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I've heard it Jim is still ways, stranded so in Houston. I'm so. <laughs> sorry, what was it's, that? It's, I said, you're still stranded in Houston, so we're having to use Google Hangouts to record this podcast. Yep, yep. It's worked pretty well, though, for the last couple of weeks. Yeah. Um, we had uh, him on with Ben last time, and then before that, it was just me and Jim, so it's been going pretty well. The, the spelling of Arc Age is a little bit weird to me, because it's got that unnecessary E. Yeah. Um, I guess it makes too. sense, because it's like it's something to separate... Like, the the CH and the A and age. Right. But it's still, I, I don't know. There's a lot of really strange translations going on there. Mm. Like, the in-game NPCs in the American release still sometimes randomly speak in Korean oh, instead nice. of English. <laughs> oh, that's And awesome, you can never actually. tell when it's going to happen. <laughs> so you'll walk up to a little merchant and he'll be like, Hey, you know, buy some of my goods. You know, how's it going? Time is money, friend. You know? <laughs> and then the next time you see him, he'll be like, da 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 Unfortunately, we don't know enough Korean to be able to... I cannot properly emulate Korean, so <laughs> hopefully I didn't offend any of our native Korean listeners out there. Yeah, there you go. We love you guys. That um, are listening in English? Native yes. Korean listeners listening in English? Okay. Speak um, so, uh, I believe our uh, sort of icebreaker warm-up for the day was going to be uh, Tales from Arc Age with Richard. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of getting a report back from him on kind of what's been going on. So, what you got, Richard? Well... So, I guess the first thing I'd have to say is, you guys have both played MMOs a fair amount, right? I know, Jim, yeah. you've played a lot of WoW. Yeah. I've played various okay. ones before WoW, too. I just haven't played that many after. Yeah. Have you guys had any sort of... Um, I guess the, the easiest way to put it would be to, say, a failed launch experience? Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> unless you count Swator. <laughs> well, yeah. So, but, um, yeah. Arc Age has been in the the throes of a week-long launch problem. Uh, from the moment the game launched, there has been server instability, uh, queues uh, that have been over 2,000 people long for, oh, wow. for every server. Huh. Um, incredible lag, uh, disconnects, etc. It's been kind of a disaster. I don't think they expected the game to be as popular as it actually is. Yeah, I think they're surprised by that. Yeah, and so the population has just been way too much for them to handle. They actually opened up two two brand new servers not two or three days ago, I think, hmm. and they're already full and with queues, etc. Nice. I actually um, I was feeling uh, like playing some arcades this morning before you guys got here, and so I booted up the computer. It was eight in the morning uh-huh. on a Friday. Mm-hmm already 800 people in queue for my server. <laughs> it's getting pretty ridiculous at this point. Um, but so this is something that has plagued quite a few MMOs, and we can talk about this later on, uh, is the sort of launch expectations mm-hmm. and how 
you know, a lot of server instability will drive away a lot of customers. I know when I first started playing Final Fantasy XIV, when it re-released as uh, A Realm Reborn, Mm -hmm. there was this notorious error. I don't remember the exact error code, but just the number became a meme in game. I think it was like (laughs) error 1706, if I remember correctly, or something like that. But it it was essentially, to play Final Fantasy XIV, they didn't have a queue system implemented, Mm. so you just had to sit there hitting enter over and over and over again to enter the character screen, select your character, select your server, confirm, enter, etc. (laughs) And then you would sit there and wait until it says, you know, the game disconnected you, server's too full, etc. And so you would just sit there mashing the enter button over and over (laughs) again until you got in. Wow. And my old roommate and I, I, Michael, uh, we would sit on our couch uh, back at the old house and have our laptops out and we would just watch Netflix while we both, and you could just hear the rhythmic (laughs) tap as we both hit the enter button over well, and over again. Like, a, a cue to get into the server sounds like such a basic thing. Like, I've always just taken it for granted. I never thought that the game wouldn't happen. You know, there's a lot of things, like when I wrote that uh, the do's and don'ts of MMO designs article, there's a lot of things that you would think are just common sense, yeah, but yeah. they don't get implemented. Like, for example, Arcage, they've had the queue system, mm-hmm. but they didn't have a grace period, for example. Mm-hmm. So if you get disconnected from the game for any reason, if the client crashes, which happens quite a bit because mm-hmm. the game is pretty unstable straight back to the queue you had to sit back through another queue and uh even Uh. now a week a week after the game has launched well i guess the head start began there are still queues at night of three thousand four thousand people people have to wait five hours to get into the game and by then it's already bedtime wow but thankfully you know about four or five days in they finally added in a grace period but so are you are you still waiting that long to get into the game? Five hours? Uh, well, sometimes. See, there's sort of this uh, community trick of you can run in circles in game, like bind your movement keys to some keys on the side of your keyboard and then like, <laughs> set a heavy object on it. Right. And so your character just runs in circles and thus never goes AFK. Mm-hmm. So you just sit there and say, okay, I'm done playing Arcade for tonight. I'll just leave my computer <laughs> alone, and then in the morning I can just get back on. Oh, that's... It's, I mean, it's that bad that it's like... <laughs> I, I would honestly say that about 25% of the population of the game is currently AFK. Wow. <laughs> Do you have any do you have any idea about how many players there are currently in Arcade? Arcade? I honestly couldn't give you a number. I've actually been trying to get in contact with the development team at Tryon, uh, the people responsible for porting it over from the Korean version to the U.S. But I mean, they're so swamped right now that um, if you attempt to open a support ticket either from their website or from their in-game support ticket, it brings up an error page. <laughs> like <laughs> they just can't handle it right now. So. Nice. I would, uh, if I had to guess, because uh, on the EU servers alone, one of, one of the EU servers has this notorious screenshot going around where there were twenty four thousand people in queue for this one server. Hmm. So, hmm. if I had to guess, they currently have over a million players. Wow, it's not bad. Yeah, and yeah. It's still not even like full launch, right? It's like still a uh, no, no start. No, the the launch happened on Tuesday. Oh, okay, I gotcha. So. Cool, this cool. is still this is still that early period though where there's a ton of people trying it out that haven't really decided if they want to latch onto it yet. Or would absolutely. you say that's true, and, Richard? Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. And this is another great topic that we can discuss later. It's uh you know, the the attrition rate in the first month of an MMO. You mm-hmm. know, a lot of people in all sorts of different creative mediums, it's like you have to grab your audience in X amount of time based right. on the field. And for MMOs, it's so true. You mm-hmm. have to have your audience there in the first like couple days, mm-hmm. I would say. Mm-hmm. And if you don't satisfy them, then they're going to leave. Yeah, it's a lot of, like movies. It's that first weekend is what's important. Mm-hmm. So, But so it's like um, with the numbers that Arcage is seeing, I don't think they were prepared for the success of their game uh, because they were saying on the forums, or on the Arcage subreddit uh, specifically, mm-hmm. they were saying that they had anticipated for a large boost in players, but they were also not going to add extra infrastructure and uh, hardware to their servers because they expected the hype to die down. Uh-huh. And that's a really interesting thing to consider because while one, 
on a financial side, it kind of makes sense yeah. because you don't want to buy a ton of server space, launch with extra servers, mm-hmm. and then have the hype die down, and now you've got a bunch of ghost towns, right, and right. you've spent all this money. But at the same time, by not doing that, you have set sort of an inherent limit mm-hmm. on the success of your game. Yeah. It's, it's interesting, too. Like you said, it makes sense from the business perspective. I, I think that they are probably being fairly realistic, you know, looking at the trends in MMOs. Like, you know, they're not expecting to be the next WoW killer. Sure. Um, they're not expecting to have a ton of people. Most MMOs don't. Um, and so I think they were, like, you know, not being too ambitious. And then all of a sudden, oh, crap. <laughs> like, we're a lot more popular than we thought. There's a really interesting conversation that can happen there, you know, in any sort of field on how you can set yourself up for mediocrity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, wouldn't you also say that the, the struggles of people actually getting in to play the game could scare some players off that might want to be long-term players? Oh, God, absolutely. Sure. That's sort of the crux of the argument, I'd say. In fact, if you go to the Arcade Reddit right now, I guarantee you that you know 95% of the posts in the first few pages are all, try on, I want my money back, or try <laughs> on, I want compensation because I bought to play this game, or I paid in to play this game, mm-hmm. and I haven't gotten my my worths out of it. Yeah, I, I haven't even gotten in yet. You right, know? yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, and um, for some of us, uh, for people who got in with the Founders packs, uh, for those who didn't know, Arcage, you can essentially, back when it was still in Alpha and Beta, you could either wait around for the closed Beta events to start up and then get keys, or you could buy the Founders packs. And for $50, you got such and such in-game bonus items when it launched, and you got access to the beta. Uh, Same thing with the $100 pack. If you bought $150, then you could have permanent alpha access as well. Mm. Um, So a lot of these people really shelled out a lot of money to get involved in this game, and uh, then on launch day, they were... uh, they were unhappy with what was going on. Oh, for sure. To say the least. <laughs> there has been, I wouldn't say an unparalleled amount of bitching at the developers, but man, it, it's pretty brutal on the mm. Reddit right now. Mm. So, so you would say standard for an MMO at launch? Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. MMOs have some pretty toxic communities, I will admit. Mm-hmm. Um, so how's the game itself been for whatever time you have been able to get in? Flawless. Flawless. It was incredible. That, that's strong. Um, <laughs> so, have either of you played Star Wars Galaxies? No. Uh, I yes, I did, it. actually. It's pretty much Star Wars Galaxies made into a 2014 MMO. Hmm. Uh, it's got everything that you could want in like the old school world PvP. Mm-hmm. You can even kill your same faction oh, as well. long as the zone isn't at peace. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. There's high seas piracy. Mm-hmm. You know, you... Uh, can just roam around the world and just steal shit from everybody. It's mm-hmm. phenomenal. So, uh, and what's that? I was just gonna. I was gonna say. Would you describe it sort of as like a Wild West sort of community atmosphere? Absolutely. Um, that's a really great uh, comparison to make. You know, in fact, uh, last night before I logged off. I did what's called uh, planting a secret farm. Uh, for those who don't know, in Arc Age, they essentially have like a sort of Facebook game system going where you have labor points that mm. regenerate over time and you can use those to plant crops and trees and uh, do crafting and things like that. And players own non-instanced land. Mm-hmm. And, like the actual game real estate, you can plot your uh, house down on top of. Mm-hmm. Or your farms or whatnot. And if you grow crops on your farm, they're protected and other players can't steal them. As long as you pay the taxes on your farm each week. Um, mm-hmm. But that's not stopping you from planting crops and trees and farm animals, etc. Anywhere in the world you want. Mm-hmm. Um in fact, one of the most, I mean, just awe-inspiring things... That, <clears throat> sorry, I'm feeling a bit sick today. One of the most awe-inspiring things that I did during the head start, I think it was on Sunday, was I climbed up to the top of this huge mountain range, and in my inventory I had bought 120 saplings for trees, you know? Uh-huh. And I just planted them all across this side of the mountain that was fairly well hidden. Uh And I came back like eight hours later when the trees were supposed to have matured and be ready to chop down. Mm. And I was like, okay, let's see if I can remember where I put these. Let's see if I can find them again. Uh And I'm just gliding around this mountain and 
I realize that this forest that's like it looks like an in-game developer made forest uh-huh. is actually the crops that I planted. Oh nice. You know, <laughs> and I essentially terraformed this mountain. It was like ridiculous. That's pretty awesome. Um I heard there's some issues with uh bullying and stuff too. Um oh, God, if you're yeah. if you're like out in the wild and trying to do that sort of stuff. Yeah, well so with this secret farming comes the fact that your crops aren't protected. Mm-hmm. So uh whenever your crops mature, um you and anybody else is able to harvest them. Uh So it's actually kind of like a profession in-game to hunt down secret farms Hmm. uh, and then steal everybody's crops, because that way you spend significantly less amounts of resources and labor Mm -hmm. than the person who would originally have harvested it, and you make a ton of money. Uh Not to mention, you get to grief somebody, and people love griefing. (laughs) Uh, Sort of the the motto of Arc Age is you know, Mm -hmm. PvP. Like, that's all the game is about. Um, I heard like in one of the articles that you uh, posted elsewhere um someone was talking about some of the griefing that was happening with uh, their farm and it sounded to me like um they were able to like form a circle and trap someone is there like is there not an ability to pass through other players no there is player collision nice yeah. that's huge like that's a huge like decision for an mmo yeah oh um, so the, so I, you can basically block people off in narrow corridors Mm-hmm. Which I, I like, given the nature of this game being kind of this political sort of beast in the sense yeah. that, you know, you have towns and you can enforce things. And part of, you know, protecting something is, you know, keeping people out of things. Yep. Uh, so. I've, got, I've got two really interesting stories that I can share about that. Uh, one of which is sort of a short one, but uh, hilarious nonetheless. Uh, in this game, uh, in when transporting certain goods called trade packs, mm-hmm. you move ridiculously slow. They have special mounts in the games, donkeys that you're supposed to get on to be able to more easily transport these across the land, Uh but you still move absurdly slow. And uh, there are caravans that travel between zone lines on a regular interval, kind of like the blimps in World of Warcraft, or zeppelins in World of Warcraft. Uh, And so it's very common for people carrying these trade packs to go over to the station where these things are going to pull up and then wait to climb onto them because they move significantly faster than you otherwise would. Uh Um, But with player collision, (laughs) you can uh, essentially bump into somebody over and over again and push them off of things. Oh, wow. And so (laughs) it's become sort of a hobby of mine to push people carrying trade packs off of these (laughs) Oh, that's horrible. (laughs) You're a pirate, aren't you? Well, I'm going to be eventually, yes. When, uh, When the guild that I'm in has enough resources to turn pirate. Yeah, we're going to be uh, rebelling against the main factions. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, um, I, I'm kind of intrigued, too. So you mentioned that your crops are protected as long as you're in a town. Uh-huh. Um, and Well, no, as long as you own the property. You own own. the property. Um, so that just means that if you own the property, nobody can right-click and harvest. Right. Or, yeah. or is it, so I guess it's not possible for your property to be raided by someone? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Unless, if, if you pay the taxes on your property, then mm-hmm. it is safe. Okay. Yeah. I guess that's a nice incentive to want to pay taxes then. Yeah, absolutely. Um, although I could also see how it be that you pay taxes, like basically protection money to the lord of the town to make sure that they're always going guards posted who can fight people off. Well, and that sort of goes into the political aspect of things. Um, You know, the game really hoists a lot of social control onto the players. Uh And so players have notoriously formed these organizations. Uh, The guild that I'm in, Outcry, on the Allo server, they've created what they call the Homeowners Association. (laughs) And for certain areas in game, uh, they allow you to plant your houses there and your farms there, Mm. but if you're going to actually use them and be there, you have to pay them. Mm. You, You owe them a weekly protection payment, you know, huh. mafia style. <laughs> and if you don't pay it, we have a website that says you didn't pay it, uh, and you'll never get out of your house alive. <laughs> so, so speaking of player, player on player death, um, is, is there no sort of reward for it? Are you able to, like, say, mug someone and take uh, their belongings or any part of their belongings? Or is it just for well, killing purposes? So there's a, there are different benefits. Uh, in, in the sort of instant gratification direct benefits, if you kill an enemy of the opposing faction, you get honor points. Mm. Uh, and so you can spend those as sort of like an in-game currency to buy different things. Um, otherwise, well, you can also, if the enemy is carrying a trade pack, the type of good that I mentioned earlier, and you kill them they drop the trade pack. So you can steal their trade goods. Similar to Eve, you know, with the real transportation of goods. Right. Oh, um, okay. That's so cool. 
the most lucrative uh, method of gaining either money or crafting regents in this game is to craft trade packs and you know sail across the ocean to some dangerous places and take these goods to these you know sort of like uh, hostile civilizations so one of the routes is to go to the main pirate island essentially huh. and if you can survive that trip with your trade pack in stow mm-hmm. then you get a pretty big payoff for doing so so it it one of the main um, goals of the pirate faction when players defect to the pirates mm-hmm. is to essentially hunt the seas for these people bringing trade packs. Huh, nice. So, uh, <clears throat> and then for the so, second story I mentioned, oh, go ahead, Jim. I was just going to ask because since you mentioned you mentioned pirates uh, prominently, are they always uh, considered sort of like the antithesis to the government forces to the legal forces, or or there is is there a concept of privateers like a government funded well, piracy? So, um, in in terms of the game's social structure, the pirates themselves are almost always considered the bad guys because it's essentially a game design element that allows players to be the difficulty factor of mm-hmm. the game. That being said, there are absolutely privateers, mercenaries, etc., very prominently established in the game. Certain guilds are actually, you know, think of like to relate it to like Game of Thrones, you know, mm-hmm. the Golden Company. Mm-hmm. You know, this is like a well-known organization that you can hire sell swords from. Uh-huh. Similarly, in the game, there are a couple of different guilds that pretty much their sole purpose is to be paid for protection. Mm-hmm. So if you're going to go sail out on the high seas and you've got your merchant ships or your trade vessels or whatever, they'll come sailing with you mm-hmm. on a galleon as protection with like 20 cannons. You know, oh, nice. and just They'll sort of protect you from the pirates. Hmm. Or, or just other players. Are, huh. they, are they usually enough to actually uh, be effective at that? Or? I haven't seen that in launch yet, oh, but okay. from what I've heard in alpha and beta, yeah. Uh, typically, these people like to ride on their own reputation. Mm-hmm. So... Um, if somebody messes with your client or they mess with your farmland or anything, mm-hmm. people respond pretty severely mm-hmm. uh, about things like this. Because in a very politically driven game like Arcage, mm-hmm. reputation is everything. Mm-hmm. And I think then that it, it's quite fitting that the setting is kind of this medieval fantasy, mm-hmm. um, because that was basically medieval yeah. times. Was. Absolutely. And so, you know, I mentioned earlier that I have two stories, and the second one is actually both related to this and another benefit of being able to kill players, especially a benefit to killing your own faction. There's this um, this mine that's used very, very frequently in Arcage. And it's one of the most trafficked mines around the like mid levels, like thirties. Mm-hmm. And uh, we decided one day that we wanted to have this mine be ours, like mm-hmm. put our name on it. Mm-hmm. And so what we did was we had a group of like ten people go to this mine, and we just swept through it from front to back and just murdered everybody in the mine, <laughs> regardless if they were our own faction. Uh-huh. And then we would <laughs> rotate, having certain people in our guild be back in the mine, like you know harvesting the ore and mining and whatnot. Uh-huh. And the other people would just be positioned, you know, sort of strong arming at the entrance. Right, right. And anybody who tried to walk up to the mine, mm-hmm. we killed them on sight. Wow. Uh, so we essentially, and then we would say in general chat and shout it out, you know, this is now Outcry's mine. We own this place. You know? <laughs> and then there would be some people that would like, um, be like I just want to get a quest done in there, you mm-hmm. know, because there are some quests, uh, quest NPCs in there that you have to get to. Right. And it's like, well, if you want a quest in there, you have to pay us, you know, five, to, five gold, ten gold, Oh, I love it. I love it. You know, and uh, <laughs> it quickly became like, a sort of server-wide attention. And within half an hour of us doing this, Mm -hmm. there were about 30 or 40 people gathered up outside the mine, like, ready to charge in, (laughs) take us down. (laughs) So it's like, okay, all right, all right, it's time for us to back out. (laughs) That's hilarious. So so, uh, it it sounds to me like um, Arcage really encourages players to be real dicks to one another. (laughs) Seems like you get a lot of benefit from doing so. Well, see, that's the interesting thing, and that's actually why I'm studying this game for my master's thesis, is I want to know if if that's true, if it encourages people to be dicks, or just by giving players that ability, what does it do to the right. community? And you know, because simultaneously, yeah, I've seen things like that where, you know, we, the guild who is intending to go pirate in two weeks, mm-hmm. you know, we'll do things like that because mm-hmm. we're dicks. But um I also saw during the head start when the game first began, uh, there were 
several notorious choke points for certain quests. Uh, one of them was like you had to loot an item on a table and then you had to wait 10 seconds for the item to respawn for the next person to get it. Mm. So when I got there, it was a huge clusterfuck around this table. <laughs> there were a hundred players like just kind of like hustling and bustling and there's player collisions. So they were knocking each other off the table, etc. Right. Trying to get to this quest item. Uh-huh. Uh, and then eventually people were like, guys, let's just organize let's get a line let's, yeah. let's form up into a line mm-hmm. and so the players self-organized and created a single file line mm-hmm. going from the table to the starting quest zone that they just came from mm. and every time a new player got to this new zone they were informed about the line process they waited <laughs> in line patiently and anybody who did step out of order and ran forward to try and steal it instead get, of gets, waiting in line gets killed yeah they got <laughs> either blocked off physically or you know etc nice um so there's a lot of player cooperation as well. Yeah, I, I was just about to say, I think one of the things that's interesting to me about this is, while it does encourage things like piracy and raiders and bandits and all that sort of stuff, um, I think at the same time, the presence of that sort of stuff is also going to encourage the presence of your mercenaries and your um, vigilantes and people who mm-hmm. are going to basically, either for free or for profit, you know, stand up to defend different players. So, you know, when people are complaining about, like, you know, being bullied or something like that, it's like, well, maybe, you know, just like, run away this time they'll get some friends and come back and not get bullied the next time you know that Mm -hmm. sort of thing so you know to sort of transition us into just sort of mmos in general and Mm -hmm. mmo design principles Mm -hmm. this is sort of something that i believe counters the issue of end game content Mm -hmm. a lot of mmos just run out of stuff to do yeah you know and uh this design wherein players are the difficulty wall Mm -hmm. it really gives you sort of endless content. I mean, you know, eventually, you know, give the game a year and every player is going to have all of their stuff farmed up and they're going to have all of their trade vessels and they don't need to sail overseas for trade goods anymore. Mm. But, you know, that's how you can sort of um, release expansions very... um, uh, non-obtrusively, mm-hmm. so you don't have to release an expansion that says, all right, now everybody's ten levels higher and there's four new bosses and three new dungeons, etc. Yeah. Instead, you can release expansions that just add new space to the game. With new space comes new spaces for people to go put their farms and houses and uh, new uh, crafting materials and new you know things to do, etc. Mm-hmm. You don't have to just artificially structure this pre-scripted mm-hmm. content. You what, know? what I just heard there, and it's pretty awesome, is basically we're um, we're discovering the new world, and now it's a race to claim the new world. Oh yeah, it, it's like that's something. History and it's awesome. That's <laughs> something that during the head start, players, our guild included, had drawn up pl- like plans, s- precise plans on how they were going to grab all the land. Mm. So <laughs> our guild had seven different Google Docs and spreadsheets and whatnot as to how we were going to get our land grab. And so what we did was we essentially had the guild leader uh, for each faction. Because we're going to go pirate, we have both a western faction and an eastern faction. It's sort of like the Horde and the Alliance, if you will. Uh Um, Mm -hmm. We have a guild on both sides because we're all going to be pirates eventually. Mm -hmm. So we'll all join the same faction. Right, right. And so what we did is the the guild leader for each side at level one just ran all the way to the ocean and swam and swam to like the big pirating islands that are (laughs) notorious for being really good pirate strongholds. Uh And then they went to a mailbox there on the island. And all of the other players in the guild, we rushed up and leveled as fast as we could, got all of the materials and the schematics for houses and farms, etc., Mm -hmm. and we all just sent it to them and donated it. Uh And so the level one that we had sent out there was getting flooded with all these houses, Uh and they just started claiming land as fast as they could on all these different islands. Nice. Very cool. Uh, So it's kind of like a land rush in that Mm -hmm. sense. Yeah, and then, you know, as Chris just mentioned, if, well, there actually, there's plenty of land already in the game that hasn't been released yet. The Korean version of the game, which came out, I think, two years ago, is far ahead. The level cap has been raised to 55. There's a whole other continent to go to. There are areas of the existing continents that were not previously built on that now there is content, you know, and so there's just a constant, like, increase in things to uh, settle, discover, farm, etc. And that sort of uh, Farmville element Mm -hmm. you know, really Ah. applies well to this MMO. Well, put put it in perspective from uh, to some other MMOs, how big would you say the landmass currently is? 
Currently, I would say the size of the world is about that of World of Warcraft at the time of Wrath of the Lich King. Okay, it's so it's pretty starting pretty yeah. big already. Yeah. There are essentially three main continents, similar to in World of Warcraft at the time. You had Kalimdor, um, Eastern Kingdoms, and Northrend. Mm-hmm. Um, now you have uh, Nuia, Haranya, and Aurora. Mm-hmm. So you're not counting then the... Um the out realms right um, correct. Okay, cool. yeah i'm okay. talking about in the consistent well, like and, and the globe of azeroth the yeah planet. essentially yeah. it's really hard to compare because mm-hmm. one of the really interesting things about uh arc age is there are no loading screens this game is not instanced oh nice the whole world is open so you can start at one corner and hit the auto run button and you will eventually circle the globe and come back to where you were before <laughs> nice that's pretty cool Assuming you don't get knocked off a cliff by Richard. Right, yeah. <laughs> I have, oh man, I have taken some sick pleasure in knocking people off of high places, I tell you. <laughs> and then leading their corpses mm-hmm. down, down below. Yeah. There's definitely a um, an element of fend for yourself in this game, at the same time as there is also very, very concrete guild structures and guild support. This is something that I've seen fading out of a lot of MMOs recently, especially games like World of Warcraft, and mm-hmm. in other, I guess for lack of a better word, mainstream MMOs uh, or cookie-cutter MMOs, mm-hmm. you know? When you start these games up, sure, the mechanics may be polished and the environments may be pretty, things like that, but the community just isn't there. Yeah. You know, uh, if you join a random guild in one of these normal MMOs, you know, you'll see some people typing in guild chat occasionally, like, hey, does anybody have this? Or, you know, complaining about some sort of class or something like that. In Arc Age, the communities are very, very real. Like, mm. um, People like every guild has a team speak, and every guild has a guild house, and people are always helping each other to farm and helping to fight off other players. Uh, you know that open world PvP aspect really brings a lot to it. I think. Cool. Very nice. Yeah, I, that's what it sounds like to me. That people are are forming together in these guilds um, out of necessity for their own survival. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's something that I think has really weakened a lot of MMOs of late is they they tackle way too much of the gameplay and not enough of the social aspects. Mm. You know, and I'm not saying that every MMO has to be a new second life, you know, you don't have to have your players role playing, mm. but you have to give them a reason to be in the game space with other people. Right. This was my issue with Wildstar. When I played Wildstar, I felt like, well, all of these things that I'm doing I can just do them by myself. Mm-hmm. Even the raid bosses and the end game dungeons, while mm-hmm. yes, I cannot beat a raid boss by myself, it's just beating a mob. Mm-hmm. It's just killing a scripted encounter. Mm-hmm. You know, and while yeah, this has been a very rewarding formula in the past, especially in World of Warcraft, there has there comes a time where you have to change. You know, you can't just keep on iterating on the same concept. Mm-hmm. So this system of social control and social design that places other players as the crux of the difficulty, mm-hmm. I think that's the new endgame content that we need to strive for. Mm-hmm. You know, though, for all of the talk about how important these social structures are, there are a lot of people out there that really just like to play MMOs by themselves, and I suppose this comes into uh, the realm of, you know, your accomplishments are inherently put in the context of other people. Yeah. You know, playing games Mm -hmm. on a console or by yourself, you know, your accomplishments mean one thing there you know you've beaten this scripted content Mm -hmm. but in an mmo space beating this content and beating these quests or getting these achievements they're not just for you anymore they're for the other people yeah so yeah i know there's a lot of different motivations for people to play by themselves and i know that games like uh the old republic you know uh they actually structured their gameplay Almost as if they wanted people to play solo. Um, I, I think that's completely true. Um, I I'm one of those people who does like to play solo most of the time um, for a number of reasons. One being that um, I just usually don't have the time or even the motivation to pour hours upon hours upon hours into MMOs. 
Um, so by the time I get to the end game, the end game actually becomes super boring for me because I'm not involved in things like guilds. Um, or even if I have friends who I want to play with, you know, our schedules usually don't line up. So I don't really have the opportunity to play all that end game content. Um, so what I find enjoyable at MMOs is I'll hop on there for a few months. And obviously I'm not the ideal customer, you know, people like Blizzard and, uh, you know, anyone else who's running an MMO wants the people who are going to be paying in month after month after month. And, you know, while I was leveling up, especially in vanilla WoW, when it was very long leveling process, um, mm-hmm. it did take me months to get to level 60. Yeah. Um, and so I was paying in for a while. Um, but all that being said, um, just, I, I like to be able to play on my schedule. I enjoy kind of having other people around. I think it's interesting. Sometimes the v- PVP throws an interesting twist. Mm-hmm. Um, but I can find just the basically long form single player experience of MMOs to be nice too. And coming back to Star Wars, the old Republic, um, you know, they have like companion characters, for instance, which basically means you have a two person party at any given time. Um, so if you're not a healer, you can have a healer in your party and it might not be as efficient as a player, but you can still go through and do more stuff than you could and say, you know, like, wow, by yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and um, I know from when I was playing Old Republic that it really had more of a narrative focus than I was used to in MMOs. Uh, I think that was probably part of it, why you could play through the whole thing um, as a single player experience. Um, I, I am curious, though, Chris, do you play games like um, sort of open world games like uh, the newer Fallout games, um, the Elder Scrolls series, the Stalker series? Do you play those in a similar way that you play these MMOs solo? Um, what do you mean by similar? I mean, I have played um, Fallout 3. I've played New Vegas. Um, I've played um, Elder Scrolls Five, at least the main story. Um, I just mean... But, uh, um, if you're playing them as a, from a solo, because uh, they are, then to me, those games are the closest that you kind of get to an MMO experience. But they're but they're solo games. They're okay, they're meant gotcha. to be played by yourself. So uh-huh. I was wondering if you play them in a similar way, and you sort of treat the other players kind of like you would treat an NPC in those games. You get more into the role play aspect, and mm, that's my thing. Or, yeah. um, no, I, I do think there is kind of an inherent. Um, mindset shift that happens when I do play an MMO um, versus those single player games um, because I do realize that they're player characters um, and sometimes okay. you know like you'll, you'll have kind of like a little drop in drop out sort of pug experience um, and you know at that point you are interacting with other players but by and large I tend to roll solo um, and I do unless it's an enemy faction player you know they're flagged for PvP I tend to treat them or think of them more as just like other people existing in this world more so than I do in PCs you know, um, you mentioned that um, MMO companies, they want the kind of player that's going to stick around month after month after month. Mm-hmm. And um, this is something, it's an interesting statistic I saw a while ago that only 10% of the players who play World of Warcraft ever get past level 10. You know? Yeah, and, I've heard uh, that, yeah. That's really interesting to me, especially for such a successful company. And it makes me wonder how much they actually do rely on the subscription fees, the subscription model. Mm. Because I know that uh, a lot of free-to-play MMOs, like Guild Wars, for example, there's no subscription fee there. Mm. Yeah. You know, they've stayed successful. They've stayed afloat. I forget that. Does Guild Wars have um, in-game purchases? Uh, I think they do, but I didn't yeah, play. Yeah, I, I believe they still do. And also, of course, you do have to buy the game initially. So right. there is that buy-in. And so With I'm World of Warcraft, that buy-in is no longer there. And hasn't been for a while. Yeah, I'm wondering what the um, what the upsides and downsides are to these different models. I know that Arcage, for example, there is no buy-in at all. There's no initial retail price for the game, and you don't have to pay a subscription if you don't want to. Hmm. Play, paying a subscription gives you access to more things. You can own land, and you regenerate your labor points faster, etc. Uh-huh. Um, but Otherwise, there you don't have to pay a dime. So uh, it's a free they, MMO. It is. It's a completely free okay, MMO. Okay, I didn't even know that. Um, and one of the interesting things about it is that cash shop element, the in-game purchases. They have really put a lot of emphasis on that. You know, World of Warcraft, for example, it wasn't until I think either Wrath or maybe even Cataclysm that you could pay real money to get in-game mounts and stuff like that. Um, I honestly can't remember. But, you know, this is WoW we're talking about, and even they only have, like, "Eh, buy these mounts and pets. You know, uh, 
now oh, are you gonna to- I, I i'm i'm just trying to remember if they had any microtransactions i think the only thing i can remember is like promotional deals where you'd get like a free amount if you happen to like buy this other product or something like that outside sure. the game yeah um, yeah they, they, they have, have stuff they have now several like of those. the mini can- diablo you remember that the mini diablo Right, World War right, Man. yeah. Mm-hmm. From Diablo three, like you get the bonus, you have like a little mini Diablo that runs along. Yeah, and then when WoW first came out, you could get the Zergling pet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that thing, man. I wonder how much that's worth nowadays. <laughs> but um, you know, that's like with Arcage though, they have their cash shop set up to be critically important. Mm-hmm. They have lots of like you know cool cosmetic stuff. There's mm-hmm. cool costumes and there's um, what they call a crest brainstorm. Mm-hmm. You can put your own 256 by 256 PNG into the game's directory mm-hmm. and slap your own image on the sails of your boat, your cloak. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, that's pretty cool. Flags on your house, nice. etc. So, so then I, I have a follow-up question to that, two of them actually. Uh, first off, would you consider um, Arc Age to be a, a pay-to-win game? And this, this, the follow-up question to that is, how much have you put into the game personally, if you okay. don't mind divulging? No, of course not. Um, so the first question, this is actually an issue that has really been running rampant across you know the internet, not just within the Arc Age community, is, is Arc Age a pay-to-win game? Mm-hmm. And... Mm-hmm. I would argue no, because all of the items found in the cash shop are either completely statless, they're all cosmetic, or if they do affect the gameplay in some form or fashion, such as um, you have, as a founder, or as a patron, uh, the subscription feature, Uh you have a maximum amount of 5,000 labor points to spend chopping trees and crafting stuff. With the cash shop, you can buy what's called a workman's compensation potion, Mm -hmm. and you can use it once every 12 hours. It has a half-day cooldown, but it it instantly gives you a thousand labor. Mm. So mm. otherwise you regenerate 10 labor every five minutes. Mm-hmm. That means for 24 hours, if you stay logged in for 24 hours, you would regenerate, I think it's 2,400 something labor. Mm. So essentially chucking one of these potions gives you a little less than half of a day's normal labor regeneration. Right. Um, so in a sense, I suppose you could call that pay to win because you can farm more mm-hmm. than other people, but you can't farm better than other people. Right. And to actually really utilize all of that labor, you would have to be planting secret farms anyway. You mm-hmm. can't you can't use all of that labor just you know, harvesting your own farm and crafting the things that you have. Right. Uh, to actually utilize all of that labor, you have to spend hours just running around mining nodes and mm-hmm. having people give you goods, you mm-hmm. know? So I would say that Arcage has successfully avoided being pay to win, mm-hmm. but it does come pretty precariously close. Yeah, it reminds, it reminds me a little bit of um, the older public when they went free to play. Um, how. Uh, it wasn't necessarily free to win, or no, sorry, not free to win. Pay to win. <laughs> Pay to win. Um, it is free to win, uh, <laughs> but you uh, you have to. If you're not subscribed, there's so many locked features, and I actually think it's a little bit ridiculous. All the things that are locked, like they're there are certain like levels of items you can't equip unless what? you pay like a, a certain license fee. Um, there are uh, like you you have like limited character slots. Like I think when it went free to play, and I wasn't playing it very much at that point, um, I paid like just a couple of transactions essentially to get all my old characters back, so that I could have my full character roster without having to worry about. Um, uh, paying a subscription fee, essentially. Sure. Uh, but yeah. then beyond that, like I just sort of refuse to pay for anything else. Like I mean, there's in addition to cosmetic stuff and that sort of deal. Um, there was just a ton of like locked features that I think are pretty obnoxious. Yeah. So you need to balance it pretty well, unless you make people angry. That's something that I think that microtransaction and you know quote unquote free to play games. Uh, they do it pretty badly, you know. And we talked about this, I think, on our first or second podcast, and it was like, you know, yes, I remember when you're locking away features from somebody or you're not giving them the full game. Uh-huh. That's not how you do microtransactions, and that's mm-hmm. not how you do the pay-to-win model. Right. I think uh, Extra Credits did an episode on this on YouTube, and it was really, really. Um, pushing for that point Mm -hmm. is that if you're gonna go pay to win or pay to win if you're (laughs) gonna go pay to uh pay to play right you have to give the non-playing players the same game Mm -hmm. just 
have the the bonuses be more. Um, mm-hmm. I don't, I don't want to say purely cosmetic. Uh, the gist of it is that you just can't keep your players from playing the real game. You can't have a fake game and a real game, right. essentially. And yeah. I, I think one of the things that Star Wars did, you know, decently well, you know, among all the things they didn't do quite right, was um, you would get experience boosts if you were a subscribed member. And so this kind of reminds me a little bit of your uh, labor thing with Arc Age, mm-hmm. um, where you still can do this stuff if you're not paying, but if you are paying, you get to do a lot more for free. Right. Um, for free, quote unquote, because yeah. you're still subscribed. Um, but in Star Wars, like you know, if you're not paying, you're going to level up slower, and you can buy with money experience boosts. Where like for however many hours you get, you know, fifty percent more experience or whatever. Um, but uh, if you're subscribed, you have all those advantages already. And so like you know, you, you you basically have the same game for two different people, but you have. You know, for the people who are paying, who are subscribing, who are playing a lot, they're going to get a quicker and smoother and, you know, overall just sort of, like, more complete feeling experience, even though mm-hmm. this game is essentially the same. So, in in uh, Old Republic, though, is there really much of an end game? Because it seems like you wouldn't want to speed up the leveling process. I know that when I was playing, faster. Um, I didn't, you know, play for very long, but I know that when I rushed my first character to 50... There was a dungeon or two, mm-hmm. and the battlegrounds, which were fairly broken in my opinion. They yeah. just did, they weren't fun. They didn't operate. Yeah, completely. the battlegrounds to um, me, I never really appealed to me because it just uh, didn't work. Hutball was kind of fun. Yeah, but uh, well, yeah, the <laughs> hutball thing that was actually so. For those who are unfamiliar, one of the battlegrounds in um, the Old Republic was essentially a game called Hutball, and you would recover, sort of capture the flag style, the ball from the other player's side of the arena, and you could actually throw the ball to you know other players. Um, and when I got to 50, I, I, I leveled my character pretty quickly. When I go into an MMO, I kind of go neckbeard mode. You know? <laughs> so I had a level 50 in the Old Republic in, I think, three or four days. And um, the battleground was just broken. You know, uh, throwing the ball to people, it didn't even work. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes you would throw it in the opposite direction or accidentally throw it to an enemy, you know? If you're trying to use a hotkey, it was tricky, yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. So, um, in terms of endgame content, uh, functioning endgame content, that was something that drove me and, a, from what I understand, a lot of other players away yep. from the Old Republic. I agree. Because I agree. it's it's one of those games that sold itself as, you know, the scripted encounters type of MMO. Mm-hmm. Solo content, fully voice acted, cutscenes, etc., and then they ran out of content, yeah. which is bad. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, before we jump into your impressions, to relate this real quickly to, like, Arcage, for example, uh-huh. they have a few world bosses to kill, mm-hmm. and, like, two dungeons that you can kind of do for good gear, but the gear is quickly outshone by crafted gear. Uh-huh. Um, players defeated yeah. those bosses within the first, like, couple of weeks to a month of alpha and beta and probably soon to be launch and the game still thrived perhaps even more so afterwards Mm -hmm. because that's just not what the emphasis is placed on in terms of the design Mm -hmm. whereas in the old republic i'd say it was yeah um Mm -hmm. and i mean you know again from the sort of the single player perspective i enjoyed my time with swator a lot more than i did with wow i mean i had some good times in wow i thought it was cool especially um once they released cataclysm they sort of had more almost like cinematic feeling um single player experiences kind of like instanced um you know open world quests which right. was kind of cool um the older public what i liked about it is even when i got to level 50 there were still different um quest areas i can go to and keep playing out my story now you're less incentivized in a way because your main story quote unquote the one that goes from level one to level 50 is then pretty much done and it's kind of like the additional adventures of your character um it was kind of interesting i thought how the one through 50 grind is actually sort of set up like a um a uh, Star Wars trilogy. They even said in the advertising, like, play your own Star Wars trilogy. Um, so I thought that was really neat. I think one of the things that really could have helped um, the older public out quite a bit would have been if, like, you know, sort of to emphasize the single player experience. And, you know, I realize that this might be tricky for a number of reasons and also because it would reduce playtime, which obviously is um, counterproductive when you're trying to make money off of subscription fees. But 
I kind of find myself wishing because essentially you've got eight different single player experiences you can play through, eight different stories, right? Um, which is a ton of content, really pretty awesome. But the problem with it is that it's essentially for each sort of planet you're on, there's like you know five quests or so that are specifically for your class. And then everything in between is just um, like the the random sort of in the world you find this NPC and right and you know after your starting zone mm-hmm. everything sort of connects and you can go to whatever planet you want right and, and the the first one maybe two times you see all those additional quests um, it can be interesting because it's kind of like how do I apply my character to this quest and all that sort of stuff but then after a while you start to know like everything that happens and starts to get really boring so I find myself wishing. Um, after all that wraparound, that after I hit level 50 and I finished my first story, I could go back with the second character and play through just that class's quests. Uh, I would get experience quickly enough, like maybe there's some sort of boost or something where you have, um, like you can do the extra stuff and it would still benefit you, but you would have enough experience just from your class quests that I could go through and experience all eight of those stories relatively quickly without having to pour, you know, however many hundreds of hours into each one. Right. Um, Yeah, that was... And that, that I oh. think I think that would have given you the illusion of having more quote unquote end game content because it's basically just extra replay value rather than you know beyond fifty content. I think that was kind of my problem with um, Swotors just in general because I I really felt they should have just made a nice deal for Public Three. Yeah. And then your your replayability is just going back. Uh, you're experiencing you're experiencing that the different classes just replaying the game. Mm-hmm with those other classes. Yeah. Then my only concern would be that uh, if they did make um, KOTOR 3, would it be the idea that you have like eight different stories or would it just be that you can go back and play the same story in different ways? Which I think if they're just making KOTOR 3, it's going to be like one and two. It's essentially, okay, I'll play light side and then dark side and then neutral. And then you don't really have the same sort of eight different story sort of experience that you get with Swotor. Well, so the thing is, like, while there is definitely some validity in, you know, saying that it's bad to have the whole good guy, bad guy, neutral route in Mm -hmm. branching dialogue, Mass Effect, (laughs) um, I think if the context allows for it, I mean, it's a Star Wars we're talking about. There is the light side and the dark side. Yeah, there's a lot of black and white in Star Wars. Yeah, which is why when I played through Knights of the Old Republic, the actual, you know, console games or whatever, I guess PC later on, you know, they it made sense that there was you could either be a good guy or you could be a black guy with yellow eyes and like a cracked skin face, like <laughs> straight up evil. Yeah. You know, whereas that doesn't make sense in other games like Mass Effect and whatnot. It's it's very binary. You uh, I, you said black also, guy. <laughs> did you mean bad guy? I, oh, did I say black guy? Yeah, you did. <laughs> yeah, you, you. I just assumed you were playing a black guy when you played Kotor. Oh, huh. I mean, I thought no. there's nothing wrong with that. Brody but... Flip. Uh, apparently, yeah. I don't think uh, that's no, Freudian, actually, but... <laughs> well, yeah, I mean... No, actually, I was I was going to say, um, I... Actually, I lost my train of thought. Sorry. With all of those jokes. <laughs> yeah. Well, so... Good and got in. While you have these moments of, you know, binary branching dialogue... Oh, I know what I was going to say, actually. Oh, okay, go ahead. Um, if I just mention this real quick, it... And even though uh, Lucas doesn't seem like he really likes the idea, there's actually it's not quite as cut and dry with the light side being good guy and the, the dark side being bad guys. There's kind of this element of using the light side and using the dark side for not necessarily good or bad purposes. They kind of have their different uses. This is something that was explored a lot in some of the expanded universe you novels. You talked about the Grey Knights? Yeah. Mm. And I think that's something that, that they, they sort of um, touched on that too, a little bit inside KOTOR too. And I would have loved to see that really expanded on in KOTOR 3. And that's something that I think was really missing from um, that series of games and what I was looking forward to. So that was probably my biggest disappointment in Old Republic, is that it wasn't yeah, KOTOR 3 and, and that's it didn't something, continue that trend. That's something that happens when you have an MMO that's designed to be a sort of uh, narrative experience. Uh-huh. You know, So with uh, The Old Republic... It was a great game. The combat system was fine. The crafting was okay. The mm-hmm. PvP was interesting, but there was essentially it was essentially a single player game that was it had online aspects thrown into it. Yeah, you know. So if they had taken the narrative elements and just transplanted that into a single player game, it would have been much better and much more highly 
received. Mm-hmm. If, on the other hand, they had issued some of the player instancing or whatnot, or at least implemented more social constructs, mm-hmm. then I think the game would have been drastically more successful. You know, I tend to agree. Yeah, and so I think yeah. this is the problem with MMO design, especially in the past decade or so that we've been seeing, is that developers focus by and far exclusively on the mechanics Mm -hmm. with wildstar their big selling point that it was you know the live action combat you know they had different combat and targeting systems Mm -hmm. you know and it just while yeah it was entertaining for the first bit you Mm -hmm. know i had never well since terra at least uh, played an mmo that was so run and gun Mm -hmm. you know but then that charm faded yeah the the mechanic mm -hmm. it got old you know Mm -hmm. it's like okay so now I'm doing just what I do in every other MMO. Mm-hmm. I hit the two button, or sometimes three, <laughs> yeah. you know, and I do stuff. Yeah. But I, why am I doing it? I think the one action MMO that I actually kind of enjoyed for a long period of time, and it was simple, but it worked, was um, Fantasy Star Online, mm-hmm. um, where you, like, attack by hitting your attack button, and you've got, like, alternate abilities and stuff like that. Um, and it, I, I liked it because it, it sort of worked. It, it was engaging enough... Um, to not just be point and click, but at the same time it worked as something that becomes super repetitive over a long period of time. Um, I thought that that was kind of well done when they did that. Well, one thing that I'm curious about, um, your experience getting into the guild, um, how you got into the guild, and generally what sort of interactions do you have with your guildmates? I don't mean in-game, I'm talking about uh, the pure social aspects. Like, say, for example, someone's listening to this and they're like, well, I want to play Arcade, but it sounds scary because it's so wild. How do I get involved in a guild? Do people, do I have to, like, put myself out there and sort of promote myself? Or do people send me, uh, like, I know there's some MMOs that I play where you'll just get inundated with tells of people saying, join my guild, join my guild. Yeah. So I think uh, that aspect might be one that we could maybe discuss. Yeah, well, I know when I... Game. Uh, went back to World of Warcraft last December for nostalgia. I made my level one character, and by the time I loaded in, I had already had a guild invitation because they have yeah, exactly. people or maybe even bots just sitting there waiting to invite everybody just to get as many people on as you can. Um, there is an interesting combination of that and a more closely structured guild system in Arcage, uh, but mm-hmm. the the invite everybody system is actually really interesting in Arcage because in WoW and other MMOs, there's no real reason to do that. You know, there's not plentiful world PvP, there's no real gain from world PvP, and instances are capped at a certain number of people. Mm -hmm. In Arcage, because all of the content really happens in the live world, the more people you have, the more you can accomplish. Mm -hmm. You know, if you take 50 people instead of 20 and you go roaming around the seas, Mm -hmm. you're going to be able to kill a lot more people and effectively steal many more trade packs and resources. Uh So this is what they call sort of the Walmart guild. Uh, (laughs) There are a couple of different ones like this. Um, I know during alpha and beta, um, for the purposes of study, I was involved in a guild that had over a thousand members, you know, and at any one point in time, they'd have 300 people online, Wow, you know? Um, so when it came time for like a global event, like, ah, this zone is at war, you know, join the war effort, Mm -hmm. you know, this guild would show up there en masse, Mm -hmm. you know, you would be there. Mm -hmm. And you just see a hundred portals pop up, you know, and they just, like, (laughs) charge through, you know? Nice. Um, However, you also have the more closely knit groups. For example, with uh, my guild, Outcry, I found them by playing through the beta, and I was just questing in some open zones, and I came across a bunch of people that were griefing their own faction, Mm. and... Mm -hmm. It was three or four different people. They were all about my level, but they were also all about 70% health. But I managed to kill two of them, and I was kind of locked in battle with two more of them. And another guy comes swooping out of the air 
in Arc Age, their version of the flying mount is a glider that you get from very low levels, and you can essentially use it to, you know, uh, glide <laughs> short distances and ride the updrafts and things like that. But so I'm here, you know, I had killed two of these four people, I was feeling good, but I figured I was just about to die to these two other people, and some dude swoops in on a glider and helps me in the fight, and we managed to take them both out. Mm-hmm. And they value very highly in Outcry your PvP abilities, your abilities to fight other players because uh-huh. they're pirates. Right. And so as this guy and I talked and we grouped up to do more quests, you know, we would intentionally seek out the kinds of people that did stuff like that, like, you know, um, rolled around in big groups, Mm -hmm. and we showed them that we could beat them 2v4, 2v5, etc., just because it was fun to do. And the guy said to me at the end of our questing, he's like, you know, hey, you know, is that how you like to play MMOs? Is that what you like to do? And I said, yeah, I love World PvP. It's like why I miss vanilla World of Warcraft so much. Uh And he's like, well do you want to be a pirate? <laughs> and so he kind of explained the mechanics to me because I was new to the game at the time. Uh-huh. And he mm-hmm. gave me this really long introduction and explained everything about it and gave me their team speak info. And I jumped in their team speak and talked to like four or five different people. And it was a very um, close and familial thing. Huh. In fact, actually, now that I mention it in Arc Age, they not only have the friends list and the guild, mm-hmm. but they also have the family. Um, mm. It's essentially a separate guild that you can invite a smaller, more limited number of people to, uh-huh. and uh, you have a separate chat, you have a separate functionality, uh, and people in your family can actually share your crops, they can share your farms and your houses and your boats, hmm. etc. And so it essentially like designs in cooperation between players mm. and closely knit friendships and alliances mm-hmm. between players. So it, it sounds pretty neat too. It's um, it, it reminds me a lot of Eve the way you describe it. Um, and how open and player driven that is, and yet it seems like it's a lot easier yeah. to sort of get into than um, the spreadsheet simulator. I, yeah. <laughs> I would, no I would honestly <laughs> say that that's a really accurate comparison. I would say it's essentially the Eve for theme park players. For those who are mm-hmm. unfamiliar, the theme park MMO is when you pick a class with certain abilities and you go and do quests that start at point A and end at point B and you're essentially given this ride through the game, theme park style. So it's essentially a theme park Eve. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, Similarly, you can lose your trade packs and your goods like you can in Eve. Your ships and vehicles can get blown up by enemies. Mm-hmm. In Eve, you lose them forever. You have to rebuild them. In Arc Age, you simply have to repair them. It costs a lot of money, but you don't lose it entirely. So it's essentially finding this happy medium between the hardcore economic driven pvp of eve right and the accessible highly playable and polished gameplay of world of warcraft guild wars and it adds in its own spin with farmville you know maybe some second life with the amount of costumes and kind of role playing that happens uh-huh. and social structures so i would say that arc age is essentially an attempt to find a happy medium between all of these successful mmos the all of these successful formulas mm-hmm. and they innovate by combining very nice now would you say in your time playing it that they have been successful oh absolutely um I think Arc Age has far succeeded anybody's expectations in the amount of success they've received. Um, well, I meant I meant successful in actually uh, combining all of those different genres oh. to create something interesting and playable. Absolutely. Uh, at any point in time, uh, I have difficulty deciding what exactly I want to do. Hmm. There's so many things to do in so little time in the day, especially for us graduate students. <laughs> so, you know, when I really want to do something productive it's like okay do i want to go plant a secret farm do i want to go hunt down other people's secret farms do i want to go to a certain zone and acquire something in particular and then if i want to pvp it's well do i want to kill my faction or my or the enemy faction (laughs) you know and then do i want to do it by joining up the arena queues and fighting people in the gladiators arena or do i want to go to a certain zone and grief people Mm -hmm. or do i want to go to the high seas and blow up people's ships with my cannons and, you know, take a group of friends and raid their ships, you know, um, 
there's just so many different options that you have and there's no limiting factor. You know, just last night we went on a trade pack run where uh, I had just built a me- medium sized boat and me and about eight other people were sailing it across the ocean to do trade pack runs. And one of the guys with us was a level 15, you know, <laughs> he is brand new to the game. And I said, like, you know what, man, you can drive, you know? So he hopped on the wheel of the boat and he was driving us around, you know, and the higher levels were just sort of like stealthed around the ship waiting for some people to approach us. Uh-huh. So, so people who saw our ship on the ocean, they're like, that's a level 15 driving that boat. And then <laughs> nope. there were a bunch of level 50s uh, stealthed waiting. Nice. And you know they would attack the poor level 15, and we would jump out of the shadows and blow up their boat. <laughs> that's pretty awesome. <laughs> cool, cool. It sounds like Arc Age is uh, approaching a pretty ideal sort of MMO design for people who are into that sort of thing. Um, whereas for people like me who like to be left well enough alone, uh, we'll probably stick to single player games. Yeah, you would hate arcade. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's one of those games that, like like Eve, I'm utterly fascinated by. Um, I find it super interesting, but just not one that I like to play personally. So right. I think that's about going to do it for us today. Um, so I'm Chris. I'm Richard. And I'm Jim. And uh, thank you for joining us for our big number 10 backward compatible podcast. And we'll see you guys next time. We want you to join the discussion on our website, backward-compatible.com. You bring a unique perspective, and dialogue makes everyone better. Leave a comment in our podcast section, and if it's good, one of the crew members will respond to it. This time, let us know which MMORPGs you've been playing recently, and what you like and dislike about the experience. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible.